Okay, well, I think we're going to get rolling. Um, we'll have lots of folks jumping on, and um, and I don't want to don't want to waste any time. Um, so tonight, as you know, because you signed up for it, we'll be speaking with Eric Kunzman. Um, I met Eric at the Click Photography Festival. It was a few years ago. How many? It, a few years, right? Three. Was it 2019. Okay, <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, we were both in uh, Mary Virginia Swanson's workshop that she was offering at the Click Photography Festival. I will put a link to her website and workshops. If you don't know about her work, you must. It's, um, the workshops are fantastic. And anyway, she always offers her very well-honed and I think often life-changing advice to emerging photographers, um, especially folks that are working at that intersection and asking those hard questions about where your work and its audience or your work and its community intersects. Um, over the next couple of last few years, I've watched Eric often with a very healthy dose of envy. <laughs> when I read what Eric's been up to the last few years, you will understand why. Um, for those of you that don't already know Eric Kunzman, he holds an MFA in book arts and printmaking from the University of Arts in Philadelphia. He holds an MS in electronic publishing and graphic arts media, a BS in biomedical photography, a BFA in fine art photography, all from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Eric's most formative mentor was Lou Draper, um, who he credits Lou with influencing his approach as an educator, photographer, and I would say a high contributing human being. Um, Eric has made his mark as a photographer, book artist, fine art printmaker, educator, collaborator, and really most generously as a mentor to um, many, many emerging photographers. And this is the time that I always remember that I forgot to stop, re start recording. Oh, did someone else record? You did it, Eric. <laughs> Eric saved me. Um, so Eric's work has been exhibited in 35 solo exhibition and has also been part of over 150 group exhibitions. And that's over the last four years. Eric was named one of 10 black and white photographers to watch of 2018 by black and white gallerists and black and white's best photographers of the year. He won the Association of Photographies UK Gold Award for Open Series in 2019. He was a finalist in the top 200 critical mass in 2019. His project, Philippic Calculus, also was awarded a Warhol Foundation grant through SIPA Gallery in Buffalo, New York. Eric's work has been published in more magazines than we could have time to mention. So I was so curious and asked Eric if he wouldn't mind sharing his philosophy for success. And what really surprised me, which shouldn't have surprised me, but did, was that he said that the, the underlying philosophy is that we always have to give as much as we take. And what I love about Eric's philosophy is how community is featured in both the process and the product of his work. Not only is community featured in how he chooses the projects that he dedicates himself to, but also of equal importance are the ways in which community is featured and how he brings that work out into the world. And what I take that to mean is when we forget the larger value and meaning of our work and its place in the world, the process starts to tighten in around us. If we place too much emphasis on the work validating us, we're asking the work to serve us instead of us finding ways to serve the work. And so what Eric is gonna to talk to us about are the ways in which he engages community in the process of making, but also in, more, in many ways, more importantly, how he engages community and the ways in which he brings that work out into the world. So welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So um, Susan asked me first just to present 20 minutes about my work so you kind of see more of my path before we get into kind of a discussion between the two of us. And then also let you know how I approach my professional practice. So I'm going to jump in, share my screen real quick. So, Susan, are you seeing the correct screen still? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Just to make sure. Um, so what I wanted to really do is just really start all the way back at my roots. This will also be the last slide 
but this, this is different ways to actually get a hold of me if you have any questions after this presentation. Um, but for me, where, where it really starts is all the way back in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania when the steel mills were actually dying. And I was exposed to photography. I was always interested in fine art and history as a young school student. Uh, not much of anything else in Pennsylvania, so all we do is still there. But what was happening as the steel was dying is all these photojournalists were descending on Bethlehem. And my high school photo professor or teacher showed the work of Walker Evans. Being in Bethlehem at the time, obviously it was gonna be instrumental. Here's the good old Walker Evans uh, two marker that's in his photos. So I spent time there, but I have a lot of other work from Bethlehem. But this is just some quick work. And I was given access to get into the steel mill as it was dying, unfortunately. But that really created a true sense of photography, being able to capture history in a moment of time, as well as being art form. And that really has influenced a lot of my other work. Let's go through these fairly quick. Um, Bethlehem, my, my entire family is still in the Lehigh Valley area, but Bethlehem is still not the same. I tease my students from New Jersey all the time that New Jersey has invaded Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We have a casino. Um, this is a mural that I made for the intro to the casino or the entrance with another RIT grad who also grew up in Bethlehem. Unfortunately, uh, my, my parents, they got hooked on the casino. Um, this is a quick series. I don't have an artist statement up online about it, but this is my reflection on uh, my parents. I grew up roofing with my father and their warehouse was about to be taken back because my parents had gambled. They're basically still gambling their money away or they were at that time. We don't talk about it anymore, um, but this was something quick that I had to do when I was there, when I found out it was going away in two days. I didn't have a tripod with me. I used a garbage can and I was running around what I um, worked in as a kid. <clears throat> so when I went to college, I was able to study under Lou Draper and I really do credit him a lot. I studied at RIT and there's a lot of great photo faculty there, but Lou really did have the most influence at a community college for me. And his work, the way he conducted his life, he'd be in the dark room working next to us in open lab times. And when I tell you it was like watching a magician work in the dark room, he was somebody that worked with W. Gene Smith. He started Kimonji Group, which is with uh, Roy Carava, Buford Smith, Tony Barboza, a lot of great photographers. It was a group for black photographers trying to help themselves understand what they were doing and then eventually push themselves further. I remember watching Lou um, work on this image in the dark room. To this date, he would, you know, put potassium ferrocyanide towards the top. And this is called the Congressional Gathering, but it was so many sheets in the backyard. And this is from the 60s, but it still resonates today very much. And Lou always talked about everything in the frame needs to be there for a reason. And I think this is one of those photos that I also watch in print that's instrumental with that. A mix between Cardi Brisson, W.J. Smith, and Roy de Carava. And this is another one. I mean, just everything that went into his life, he was always watching always paying attention. The fact that Martin Luther King had to look up at a, a white gentleman. Um, so Lou had passed away and I wound up taking the position that he held at Mercer for three years. And the school had raised enough funds that my company, I was able to work with Kimonji for first editing down the images and then publishing Lou's book. And this is the final book that we created. And in fact, I just had to leave this virtual symposium. It's going on for the next eight Thursdays or seven Thursdays, every Thursday through October 15th, they're talking about Kimonji. The exhibition is called Working Together, Lewis Draper and the Kimonji Workshop. Um, if you have a chance, it's free. It's through the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And I still hear Lou's voice when I'm photographing sometimes. With everything going on since June, this was an image when I was photographing my series, which we'll talk about in a little bit that I came across and I heard Lou and it was immediately to me it was locked in arms overcoming this barrier um, and that was an image that I created just with Lou's true influence so real quick I'm gonna go through these so the only thing I remember from my education RIT there's two projects that I had that came out of it 
this is something that was fun. I was able to do an internship at McGuire Air Force Base. So I was able to photograph the Blue Angels midair, all the cool geeky stuff a true RAT photo student would want to do. Night vision scope on the artillery range at Fort Dix. Then we were able to wing walk and take photographs as we were parachuting down. I don't know if any of you believe that, but when I went back to RIT, that's what I told my faculty at the time, and they thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And then I mentioned that these planes were all on the ground, it was photoshopped. And this is back in 1997. So my faculty were like, that's unethical. But I'm like, you taught me how to do this. But at the same time, what I did get from the RIT education is this particular image, where we have the tools to create the images that we need to. With the Golden Knights, the parachuting team, they were gone faster than I could snap my finger, so I slapped on the fisheye and just let the motor drive run. This is in the days of film. And I, was able, I got lucky with this. I had no idea until the film was developed. Um, this is something that I kind of live by, that everything looks worse in black and white. So I guess it's why I work in black and white. But when the only other series that I remember from my time at RIT was when I went on the Southwest Photo Workshop through the Southwest with Willie Osman and Ken White for three weeks. It's a much larger series. Due to time constraints, I'm just showing little snippets of some of these series. I'm part of what's called the RIT Big Shot. I'm now one of the coordinators where we go into different environments and get large crowds and we paint with lights. We worked at Churchill Downs, the Alamo, unfortunately, the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Sorry for any Cowboys fans. Um, but, and then I started teaching at RIT because I concentrated on inkjet printing with that electronic publishing masters I have. And my second year of teaching, was the second day of class for the freshmen and it was 9-11. We were not canceling class because uh, it was our way of fighting terrorism, our president said. I had no idea what to do. And I was going on the way to school, stopped at a gas station, happened to look at the newsstand and looked at the newspaper. And so I decided we were just gonna talk about how news and video would influence that day going forward. And one of the assignments that we came up with was calling everybody that we knew students and myself and collecting as many newspapers as we could. So after 15 years, I went back and resurveyed those students to see what they remembered. And some remembered the smell of the classroom, some remembered nothing. And with that in mind, what the exhibition was, it was my statement as well as the department chair at the time, but everything else on the walls was the quotes from the students and their survey. And this is what we did for the 15th anniversary. So here's just some images from when I was um, taking my own students from Mercer County Community College throughout the Southwest. But to be able to truly help those students, I couldn't work with four by five or mini format. So I started creating this body of work that's called peripheral visions. It's extended, a lot of them are 360 degrees, 240. This one's 390 degrees. Because that way I could walk away and come back to the photograph. And you'll see where this come, becomes important later on. So when I was at Mercer County Community College running the program for three years, I also was taking, uh, working on my MFA at University of the Arts in Philadelphia. One day, I used to run out the Eastern State Penitentiary, which is one of the first penitentiaries in the United States, actually the first, started by the Quakers. And the idea was that you'd give penance to God. To me, it was just another peeling paint institution until I came across the original warden's logbooks from the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s. So it predated photography. Um, my bookbinding professor, Haiti Kyle, was the head conservator at the American Philosophical Society, which is part of Independence Hall. So you're gonna start to see a theme through this talk that every, a lot of my series are just serendipitous. If I never came across these logs, I would have never photographed at the penitentiary because I hadn't before. But the marks and all the different pieces to the pages is where I started to really see this. I went in about 362 times to photograph, but Haiti, the books were falling apart. So I made an arrangement that I could go photograph all seven of the log books in exchange for having access to them so I could read them before I would go in and photograph. So that exchange was more of a barter than anything else. And that's what really influenced this body of work. And there's a lot of images to this series. You're only gonna get seven of them. The joke was after 362 times, this is my, um, self-portrait that I put up next to my artist statement at exhibitions, because this is how I felt when this series was concluded. 
So at that point, my wife and I, we moved back to Rochester, New York. Just checking out time real quick. And I started Booksmart Studio. Booksmart Studio has been around since 2005. We used to have two galleries, print for artists, make books, all sorts of things. This is just giving you an idea. This is a book I created in my own work, Exposing Saints. It's all photo geek humor. The maps before them give you a description of a photo saint. You flip it up and it gives you a potential photograph and prayer to that photo saint. And to go in your camera bag. This is a catalog edition book meant for that exhibition that art will give. And this is Peripheral Visions, which is a nice clamshell box, um, really limited edition to 50. But this is more or less what my book arts and the RIT geek coming together do. Um, the person that named Booksmart Studio, when I first started teaching RIT, Dan Larkin used to call me Booksmart Boy. Well, this is using Haiti Kyle's structure of the flag book and bringing the two together. A portfolio for Marshall Shuttle for his Santa Fe portfolio reviews back, I think, all the way in 2015. I can't remember. But my kids, my kids are a big, important role. They'd kill me for this because my son's now 10, my daughter's five, so these are old images. I have a severe Dr. Pepper addiction, so my employees gave me this Dr. Pooper onesie. I have both my son and my daughter in that at this point. But my daughter, my daughter is a big influence in my work right now. My son is eh, with photography, but my daughter, when she was two years old and three months, would steal my wife's iPhone, convert it to black and white, and start photographing and documenting the house. And these are three of those examples. Um, owning a business in upstate New York, it is not very fun. We have one of the worst states to own a business. And this is a quick series that I'm still working on, which is a reflection of that. And this series eventually led to what I'm working on now, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. This is my son. I normally don't get to take photos. You can see he's oh so grumpy. But that leads me to my series, uh, which is something that Susan has seen and a few of you may have seen already. But self is falsified calculus. And the reason it started is I moved my studio to a different part of Rochester. It used to be by the Eastman Museum in the Memorial Art Gallery. When I moved, the first truck, these are three kids that came over. And a lot of my colleagues and friends were labeling the area as a war zone. Can't believe you're moving there. So from right to left, it's Harry, Elijah, and Grumpy. Grumpy got his name from when he was two years old. Somebody took a lollipop from him, and the name stuck because he was Grumpy. Uh, but my son plays with these kids. Um, Harry, unfortunately, Elijah, and Grumpy have moved out of the neighborhood. But that knee-jerk reaction of a lot of people is why I started this series, which was trying to figure out why people were labeling it, because I feel safer there than by the Eastman House. My old place was broken into three times in nine months, they got us for about $85,000 in mats. They'd throw the pieces on the ground and just take the mats. And so that's why I started exploring. And I found three things, uh, corner stores, neighborhood bars, and pay phones. And there was a plethora of them in the area where my studio is. I'm just gonna go through these. You can see them online that we have, we have more time to talk. And this series is still ongoing. Um, I have 1,455 payphones in Rochester. I have somewhere around 900 that are photographed. And many of them I go back and resurvey. And one of the big points for me is actually gonna show the maps when it's at SEPA Gallery in April through July. I'm working with other professors that are smarter than I am for making the maps. So I wanna show the census information and demographics of race, economics, um, just all the different pieces that go into where these payphones are still located and why people are still working with them. This is how they're labeled, the phone number and the locations. And I'm photographing whether the phone is there or not. And sometimes it's so much better without it. And there's a lot more to this body of work, which there will be other future talks you can watch about that. I want to really make sure we get into talking about professional practice. During COVID, going around and photographing. I mean, these will be a period of time that I wouldn't have had otherwise. This is one where I actually I was chased out of photographing this payphone before because it's a nail salon. And the gentleman came running out, no payphone for you. Because I asked his permission, then I told him what I was doing. So once it was closed, I was able to go back. 
during the riots, after everything with George Floyd in Rochester, they even destroyed this working payphone. So now that's one less means of communication for those that relied on this in this area. And I resurvey a lot of them. So one other part to this is, as I have exhibitions, I've been lucky enough to travel to a lot of the solo exhibitions. And as I'm doing that, I'm expanding this so it's also throughout the United States. So what happened when Magnum Photography was in Rochester a few years ago, doesn't happen again where it looks like I'm putting down Rochester. Rochester is not the only community that still relies on payphones. And I really re realized this when I was at um, Mary Virginia Swanson's masterclass, January, 2019. And I'll get to an image for that. This image we pulled up to, my daughter was with me, and my whole family was, but my daughter, or the bus pulled in Mirror Woods yells out payphone. All the adults turn around, you would have thought they, they were mesmerized by why she knew what a payphone was, but then she gets off, goes up, picks it up, and says it works. And everybody, I thought they were thinking it was a performance piece. But this is where, when I was going to Mary Virginia's, Mary Virginia Swanson's masterclass, I got there a day or so early, and I came across this strip mall that had been turned into a homeless encampment. And I pulled over to take the payphone, the photograph of these two payphones, and these two gentlemen were telling me about that they turned off these payphones on them about two weeks before and where they had to go to utilize payphones for communication. I drove to those locations and sure enough, they were. And that's really what helped me to realize that I need to make sure I'm telling the story that if they're not just in Rochester, they are still a lifeline for other individuals. Um, tomorrow night at Gallery 19, in Chicago, this opens up as a solo show. They're not doing opening, but instead they recorded a video about this project. So you can learn more there. I don't just photograph payphones. I also work on fake news. Um, this is a project since the election. Again, why? Because of my kids. My son, when he was in first grade, instead of um, kids playing on the playground, they were having debates about Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. The school held a mock election because of it. And what came out of it was the fact, um, we asked my son, who are you going to vote for? And he said, Donald Trump. And we asked him why. And he said, because Hillary Clinton's going to make China great again. And we're like, wait a minute, that sounds way too familiar. And we asked him, where did you see that? Because we didn't talk politics to him. And he said, we saw it on TV. And what we found out is it was a commercial in one of the Philadelphia Eagles football games as we were watching it the next Sunday. So we realized we need to talk to him about politics. Tomorrow night, this is opening in an exhibition and there's an artist talk on Saturday just about this work with the Rochester Contemporary Art Center. And what I'm doing is creating, I've been taking screenshots every day. At first it started with CNN, then it moved to CNN, ABC, Fox, New York Times, and Washington Post. And at once COVID hit, it became so many times a day that now, just two months is over a thousand pages. And again, this is a whole other series. If you're interested, you can listen to a talk about that on Saturday, but just showing you some of the things that I'm doing. This is taking on my life. No matter what happens with the next election, I'm either done at the election or when the next inauguration takes place, depending on who wins, seeing what happens. But either way, I have to be done with this because it's been taking over my life. Unfortunately, yesterday and today, Rochester is, um, unfortunately this happened in March. So it's, it was before George Floyd and any of the other incidents. And so now we have, it's right in our backyard. This is literally two blocks from the Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass neighborhood. And it's happening right there, which is about three blocks from my studio. And so that's where everything that I'm doing is trying to bring this news back in front of people. So what I'm trying to do, Susan was talking about community, October 14th through 21st. This resides on fakenewsarchiveproject.com. And what I'm trying to do, first it was supposed to be an in-person event. That's not going to happen now. But I want people to take the JPEGs, take the PDFs, and rebroadcast the news that we've all forgotten about over the past four years and get it in front of people. I am looking for help for this. This is not about me. This is about reliving no matter where you are in the political spectrum left or right it's about reliving the events that's happened last four years uh right before COVID hit i had this exhibition at a smith gallery and it was a community event here's a time lapse 
and this was the events that were supposed to take place in June. And then I was hoping in October, which isn't gonna happen, which was allowing individuals to take the pages and broadcast what they felt were important events. And this is just a quick time lapse. What I'm hoping we can do is on social media, we can do that as well. So with that in mind, oops, let me go to the next slide. This is also another, this is how much it's taken over my life. On all of our iPhones, we have the ability to have albums of families and friends or other pieces. Here is what my album looks like for people. Don't laugh too hard, but it is filled with nothing other than politicians and other people that have been in the news over the past few years. This is why this project must end soon. So on that note, I'm gonna stop sharing because the rest is about professional practice. We'll come back to it. So. Thank you, Eric, that was great. Appreciate that. Well, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we talked about was that you and I were talking about is just uh, a couple of funny things. First, I think you were telling and sharing with me about how it wasn't easy for you to edit your own work. So I didn't know if you wanted to start with that story. I thought that was a great story. That was fine. So obviously, Susan, I have talked about this to make sure um, we're trying to give you the best experience tonight. <laughs> So in 2005, when I was first starting to apply for exhibitions, jury shows, solo shows, whatever it was, I was picking my work. And because I was so attached to it, I kept getting those rejection notices that we all get. And so finally, one day, my wife says, why don't I pick one? And I was like, all right, go ahead. And of course, get the rejection notices for the two that I picked. The one she picks gets in. Um, so that happened for a few times and finally I was like, all right, you know what? You pick two, I'll pick one. Her two get in, my one doesn't. And it really started to help me realize about sometimes we are so emotionally attached to our work and I'd show photo friends and they might side with me or my wife or be somewhere in the middle. But I decided that, you know, the unattached eye, the untrained eye, my wife is an educator. She's um, academic working within the Rochester City School District no formal photo background, no real art background, but yet she was able to see the work better at times than I was. And another thing that I did with a photographer, oh my God, COVID rain right now, um, in Pennsylvania when I was down in New Jersey, we would swap files. He would work on my file, I would work on his files. And what we would get back sometime was more interesting and showed more about what we were actually originally trying to capture because again, why did, um, why was Ricardo Barros able to see sometimes better about my images and what I, the reason I was photographing that? And this is something I make my undergrad and grad students do, and they all get so anxious, high anxiety, when they have to give somebody else their raw file or their raw scan and just let them work on the file. Mm. So. Yeah, and you know, I think another thing I was really touched by in, in the conversation with you is that we kind of get this idea, right, that if our work's really personal and we're doing work that, that feels really true for us, that we're going to have thicker skin. And I think what you were sharing with me that was so important is that it's never not painful. It's, if you're doing authentic work that's really close to the heart, there's no rejection that doesn't sting. And um, yeah, so anyway, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that a little more. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, and that's one thing that I know even my colleagues. And it's also good having somebody talk about how that really sucked. I was really hopeful about this. Um, but yeah, no, even the smallest rejections still hurt. Um, the largest ones, sometimes you can expect that, okay, I know this is going for broke here, but it's a long shot. So it might not hurt as much, but it still does. And my goal has always been for every rejection that I get, I would apply to two, two more. So I apply to a lot of exhibitions now because of all the rejections. And one of the best parts, I think of um, Mary Virginia Swanson, Swanee's masterclass was Lisa M. Robinson coming in and she showed a slideshow, which was all of her, not all of them, but a lot of rejections with some intermittent acceptances. 
And it just helps you to really realize, you know, that we're all in this together and different people, different jurors, different curators, different times. Mm -hmm. There will be a different response to your work. Even still after that, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I just have to remind myself of that every once in a while afterwards. Um, and the pile of rejections is much, much more than what you see on my CV or anyone else's CV. And you just have to remember that. Um, I think you were going to share, I, th I think folks are going to be really curious about your process of applying to get into shows. And um, I'm also going to stick um, swannies.com uh, down in our chat window for those of you that are interested in looking at those. Um, it, there's a, a long list of folks that are succeeding in their craft right now because of their relationship with Swanee. So definitely check out her website. And if everybody's especially nice to her tonight, maybe we'll talk her into coming back and, and talking to our community. That's also, I heard know. give her a few days. She's launching a new website tonight. So okay. give, it a, give it a week because okay. you never know when there's a new platform. So Swanee, just trying to help you out <laughs> with that one. I heard she's literally tonight launching a new website. So go there in a week, everybody. Okay, go there in a week. Go there in a week because there's nothing worse than all sorts of people showing up when you just launch it that night. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. And this is one of the images that I feel it really expresses for all of us. You know, if you see the sign, this was actually my building in my old studio. Uh, it was the Anderson Arts Building. One of my um, clients was moving into that building. All the paper was ordered. We were about to decorate the entire second floor with different photography. And this is what happened. And just the idea of good luck being the opposite way. All of us feel this way sometimes about our rejections and what, what's happening. It's, it's a fact of photography for all of us. Come on. There we go. So my CV, first glance, this is my solo exhibitions that I have or have had and, or will have. Um, I was able to get gallery representation through HOTE, which is, stands for Humans of the Earth. The two of our mentality, it's great working with her. And the reason is because it's a lot about what we're doing. The idea of being invested in the work and our life experiences. So here's some more and some awards. But again, what you're not seeing is all of the rejections. We never see all of those rejections or how much it took to even get these. And that's kind of what I want to go through with you a little bit. So Thou Art Will Give is an exhibition. It, Body of Work started in 2003. 2014 is when I finished. It was my personal deadline because I was giving um, the Dyer Art Center where I teach at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf at RIT. Um, I work with the deaf students in the associates level. I support the students that are in the photography program. And then I also teach for the photo program, the undergrad and graduate students. So I get to wear multiple hats so I don't get to be bored. But I had all four galleries at this location. So that's where I said, that's my deadline. That's when I'm done. I'm no longer going to scan. And this was a series, or this was the installation process for this exhibition. There was over 100 images that were printed. Um, the logs, which I've never shown anywhere else, which is in this image, was a personal, I took one of the galleries for personal reflections on what the logs meant to me. It was really more for closure of this body of work than anything else. Again, I have not shown these anywhere else. They are CMYK gum biker prints, which then I learned with Sarah Van Kieran at University of the Arts. So sometimes it was just about that. I am spoiled because I've had Booksmart Studio since 2005. Um, when we moved to the new facility, I have a dark room, a non-silver dark room, the wide format area, um, a book press where we make our books, the book bindery. Again, I'm spoiled. But it's part of why I also invite other cool RIT faculty down who there can be reciprocal relationship. We can bounce ideas off one another. Um, that's a big part to my studio. My daughter is my biggest critic with this latest work, Philosophic Calculus. That unfiltered mind and unfiltered way of expressing things has actually truly helped push this work further. As you can see, my son looks really enthralled in this. 
Nobody is participating, but this is the image that my daughter saw first. And she is now the person, if I'm applying to jury shows, that I go to and ask her her opinion. And this is not a joke. When my son was her age, he went to a, an opening for RIT, which was the Co Cuba Photo Workshop. My son wound up being the guest critic for that. And he went around to every student and every faculty member that was on that trip and critiqued their work. And every student kept saying that they, they agreed with everything he was saying. Uh, my son kind of lost that, so I'm trying to make, bring him back into it. But my daughter, I'm really trying to make sure she doesn't lose that as much as possible. But it is family affair. Uh, my studio is a separate facility, separate building in Rochester. We live elsewhere within Rochester in one of the suburbs. But that led to Lensworth. It's been exhibited in quite a few solo exhibitions. The latest work, my entire family was here as I'm photographing this. So sometimes my family's with me, sometimes I'm out alone, sometimes I have colleagues from RIT, really depends. But my daughter has um, an addiction for trying to find pay phones also now. She can spot them before I can. And these are just some, as I'm working on the series, it was awarded Dotto Magazine, which is really one of the first magazines that award anything to help push the work and this is early on uh, this was march of last year 2019 one of the most meaningful things when we talk about and i'll talk about this in a few moments about having a mentor or working with somebody that can push you a little bit further sometimes that's my colleagues at rit sometimes it's people that i meet at photo reviews and and I, it seems like we're plugging Swanee's masterclass, but she really did push me much further with the fact of how it's great to have this in galleries. But if I'm truly doing this body of work about making people aware of that they're using the payphones as a social marker or um, that they're also a lifeline for individual and we need to make sure they still have access, then I need to do more community engagement. And one of the first things was the city newspaper, which is part of the public broadcast station, it's our free paper. They ran a cover story and talked about the series. They were gonna do a lecture series pre-COVID. So it's great having it in the galleries. But how do I make people aware of, in the middle of COVID, the communication company just claimed bankruptcy. So how do we make sure that this is still subsidized for individuals that need to use them? Um, so do you want me to stop here or do you want me to continue about how I find my opportunities, Susan? I am dying to hear how you find your opportunities. <laughs> I think lots of other folks are too. So there's a lot of other websites, but the websites that I primarily rely on would be Submittable. Um, Santa Fe um, Portfolio Reviews, you have to use Submittable. But on Submittable, at the top, you can see Discover. And you can filter down. And you can see there's a lot received. Unfortunately, on Submittable, not all the institutions update when you get your rejection. You just don't hear or you get a rejection from a separate email. That takes place. But callforentry.org was probably one of the first that I started working. And a lot of people tend to work with this one. You upload a portfolio and then you can simply apply. I'm showing you my good page because my archive is where I throw all of my rejections, which is what you can do. Um, so I like to keep all my acceptances on the first page, but it also helps me if I'm building my CV. And that's really the reason for that. Another website is artdeadline.com. When you have a serious body of work and you go to artdeadline.com, this is where you can find free submissions if you have a full series, not the jury shows, um, not the pay to play, which are also very important. But artdeadline.com, if you click on the top, you'll see for exhibitions or even portfolio. And it's a lot of university galleries where you can find these opportunities. I'm a member of InLiquid, which is part of in Philadelphia. They have opportunities that are different than others, sometimes on their website. But being a member, my portfolio is there. And the reason why I'm still a member, even though I'm not in Philadelphia, is I learned more about exhibiting from the Philadelphia community than I did when I was a student at RIT. And InLiquid is just a great organization. Lens Scratch, there's a full list of all of these different resources. Again, I'm just going through a few that I think personally are the most important. It was really those first three, Submittable, 
art or call for entry and artdeadline.com. And many of the things listed on Lens Scratch and some of these others, you'll actually have to use one of those to actually apply. Another organization that I belong to, being an educator, is spenational.org. But you can still go to their website and see the resources, and they have a list by order of date, which is nice, on different calls for photography. Um, portfolio reviews. These are the portfolio reviews I've attended. I have them broken up into three categories on purpose. Um, Photo Alliance and Santa Fe Portfolio Review in 2015, 2017, I attended. I had a finished body of work. When you have a finished body of work and you show up at the portfolio rank review, you're basically hoping for a carrot that, that A, you wanna exhibit my work or publish it as a book. But I don't feel I ever got as much out of the portfolio review because I, I didn't make any real connections because all I was doing was looking for opportunities. Click Photo Fest in 2018 is really the first that I would say, because I showed up with my Eastern State Penitentiary body work and I was just starting on the pay phones. It was Charles Geis who told me, stop showing the Eastern State work, it's done, it is what it is. And I brought it because he had seen it before. And so I started showing the penitentiary, or I mean, the, sorry, the pay phones, because this is what you need to show. And so I was doing a mix with some of the reviewers and everybody started saying, yeah, the payphones is what you need to be showing right now because I was more open because it was brand new at the time. 2019, going through the portfolio circuit of Photo Cita, Santa Fe, Photo Nola, Photo Fest, I got much more out of it because this series is not done. I was more open to having an actual conversation and not just trying to finish a, a finished body of work. So if anything, my next slide is what did I learn? Truly, I think one of the best ways to attend portfolio reviews is when you're not always 100% complete with the body of work. If you are, still be willing to listen and make those connections. The portfolio reviews, there's very few opportunities that come directly from them, but instead make sure that you're going through and trying to build relationships. I've had more of building relationships out of the portfolio reviews than anything else. Where did I fail? We talked about it. the one part, which was showing up with a finished body of work and just trying to expect that I'm gonna get an exhibition or a book out of it. Um, I'm also horrible at following up with people because I don't wanna be pushy. And I joke that this is my kryptonite. I'm getting a little bit better at it. Um, it's something that I'm working on personally. It's something that a lot of photographers have issues with also. Um, but in the past three days, I've really made an attempt and it's actually worked out pretty well for me, which what we can talk about later on. Um, but the idea is just doing that. I also then went to Mary Virginia Swanson's masterclass. It was January, 2019. I still have a list that I'm working on and I know other people. I see Kathleen Tunnel Handel is on here also. She still has her list. There are other participants we joke that we're still working on a list from January of 2019. But that pretty much, I don't think I'd say anything more about the mentorship. But what I did learn from some of these guest lectures, we talked about Lisa M. Robinson, that slideshow that she showed, how humbling it was seeing somebody that's very successful, um, showing the rejections and not. Susan K. Grant talked about her traveling exhibitions. And what I learned from that, right before I was awarded five solo shows, and she talked about trying to schedule them back to back to back. So one gallery ships the next, the other one ships the other. Otherwise you're losing money because oftentimes they will pay shipping one way. And it just happened about two weeks later, I was in that situation. And thank goodness I heard Susan's uh, discussion a few weeks before. Another thing that is talked about quite a bit is project domains. So my fake news archive project.com is one domain. And then I also have rochesterpayphones.com because that way the community in Rochester who I'm trying to talk about that body of work can go access just that not work and they don't have to sift through all my other bodies of work. Reciprocate that mentorship. I, as an educator at RIT, as well as through other opportunities, I learn more through mentoring other photographers. Hopefully as we all go up those steps, we don't forget those that are, might be on the step one below or two below us and help pull them along is one thing that I truly believe on, believe in. 
everybody might roll their eyes at this one about social media. It really does help if you do it well. Um, I received an email before this talking about from Swanee about the social media. There's actually, with PhotoFest, there's actually a workshop coming up. So if you feel that you're not using it properly, this is, I think it's about five hours on a Saturday for about $85. But we are building a community on social media, just like you would be doing at a portfolio review. And that's one thing I have had opportunities actually come up because of social media. Um, I was flying out to San Francisco for the exhibition and I got an email from Wired Magazine. We want to send an appointment to go into Wired and talk about a potential, just um, some potential opportunities. So I had to have my portfolio ship from Rochester out overnight to go meet with them. But it came because of social media. I'm not downplaying COVID-19. My kids wear masks all the time. But we did have one positive thing come out of nine. COVID-19, which is what we're doing right now. We're all able to have this conversation because of Zoom. There's many institutions that you can be a part of their programming, their communities. Make sure you take the opportunity. It can be overwhelming because there's too many. So you really need to make sure it pertains to what you're doing for your work. Lastly, this is the last piece of this. How do I keep it all organized? Well, pre-COVID, I was pretty good. Since COVID hit, I've been horrible at keeping things organized. There's what's called artworkarchive.com. This is where I put all of my work. And what I'm able to do is I can put my pieces up on Artwork Archive. I can then keep track of my editions, if it's sold, if it's proved. And I was looking at this, preparing for this today, and I realized I know I'm on number nine of 15 for this particular image, the drapery. When I move from eArtist, which is what I used to use this platform, I never update it. So again, I still have work to be doing. Locations, different galleries or magazines that you might be in. You can keep their contact information. Who was the person? So we can go back to that to help with my newsletter for other pieces. My exhibitions. Again, if I ever lose my CV, or if I want to go back to see what pieces were in a body of work. With each of these, Gallery 19, I will assign the images that they are working with. Down here, you can see Drury University solo show. I know what 30 pieces were exhibited there. So I can always have that as a resource. This is where I've been slacking. I have not put my upcoming exhibitions in here because this can actually email you weekly, letting you know when you need to send work off to locations. It's great to have that reminder. And then you also have contacts. You can actually invoice through this if you want to. Let me skip that for now. Um, but that's really what I wanted to share with you in regards to how I approach my professional practices. So I'm gonna stop sharing that for now. Um, remind, I wanna remind folks that um, of course you can be typing your questions in the chat window. We welcome that. I have about 500, so I'll just stagger mine <laughs> in between the other folks. Um, Eric, my first question to you is, I'm imagining that as you start to look at all these places to apply, that you're starting to be more discerning. Like how or what, what work do you do up front to make sure that you're a good fit and also the pay to play stuff. I mean, there's sure there's times probably when it's worth investing the money and I, I would just lo love to hear more about your discernment process in terms of how you're choosing what you apply to. So the way I'm choosing what I'm applying to now and I'm starting to narrow that down more and more and really just focusing on the solo exhibition mm -hmm. is if it's somebody that I feel is important as the juror, it's not that the work's gonna get in there, but I really hope to get it in front of certain people. And that's something that I've learned along the way from other people. Um, and really, I mean, sometimes other opportunities can come about. I've asked for a letter of support. I'll be honest, for the Guggenheim application I'm gonna be working on. That came about because A, first a portfolio review, then I put work in and had that one of the people juror or something, and then had a follow-up portfolio review because of the work being juried in there. Mm -hmm. So it built that relationship. And that was really what I'm trying to focus on. And also there's the different levels of the galleries. And it's that same idea of the steps. 
-hmm. Hopefully that you're not just getting into the galleries, but you need to challenge yourself and make sure you're putting it in front of people that are going to be that worthy. Um, because $35 for an exhibition, you're supporting that gallery or the museum, but you're also getting that work potentially in front of somebody and they might not pick it for that because they might be looking at an overall theme, but they might remember that or as they start to see more of it. So. Yeah, that's great advice. We were just sharing this the other day that as we bring curators on to engage with the archives that we're building through Six Feet Project, um, a number of the photographers here are already being contacted by people who had just, just guessed jury to gallery or um, so, yeah, I appreciate you. appreciate you mentioning that. Um, folks, feel free to jump in with questions if you've got questions you want to ask. And um, Eric, I'm curious, are, are you at the point now where you're just doing, are you still just doing call for entry or are you starting to do cold calls out to people where they're there are museums that you're interested in where you're going to sort of bypass that system and just have a direct relationship with them. Let me grab some real quick. <laughs> the disappearing. You know what I'm grabbing? <laughs> I do. I love this book so much. <laughs> um, so one of my resources that I've built over a period of time is basically, especially at artdeadline.com and some of the others, is these are basically galleries that have open call for submissions. Hey, Eric, Sorry. your book's disappearing, yeah, because of your background right. thing. Let me get more light. Here, I'll take care of it. Sorry. Uh, it's the, invis the invisible look. Don't judge my background, everybody. <laughs> I'm at home right now. All right. So this is how thick this binder is. It's a mm -hmm. fairly thick binder. Um, by going through these different websites, print them out, they're organized first alphabetically and then if some have deadlines I have them organized through that mode but this way I can go through and see some of the different opportunities that are out there and unfortunately each one does require different formatting for that um, but this is my approach I'm as I said I'm not pushy so I'm not good with the cold calls um, but this really especially a lot of the university and college galleries and some commercial We'll let you know that one time of the year when they're looking for submissions. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most organized I am in my life, to be honest. And the reason is that's where I really go ahead and try to push my work further. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Diana Green was wondering, um, what was a social media tip you've learned to, so that you could get better at it? So are, do you have any social media tips that were given to you or that you could pass along? I'm stealing from Swanee right now, <laughs> but hashtags, uh -huh. as well as simple things like hashtagging your project or things that pertain to what you're doing. Don't fight with the millions. Don't hashtag photography. Why are you going to hashtag photography when there's so many posts? Because there will be editors out there trying to filter stuff down. Mm -hmm. So another one is Rochester, New York photographer. That's the demographics where I live. Um, for me, payphone is a huge one. Mm -hmm. And there's actually now what's called payphoneography on Instagram, which makes me shake my head because there's a lot of people now documenting when they have a payphone sighting. But at the same time now, I have some of those people that are willing to collaborate because when I go to different galleries in the future, I'm hoping to have some community participatory events. Well, now I know I have somebody in LA, Portland, that is wanting to exchange and work together. So that's another idea of the, the community building, even within Instagram. But really making sure your posts are professional. If you need one for your family, uh, family and friends, have a separate account, but people will still be able to find it. But really, I have Eric underscore Kunzman. I also have one for my studio, Booksmart Studio. And I have one for fakenewsarchiveproject.com. Just with everything going on lately, the only one I've been applying or adding to has been the Eric Kunzman at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else have other questions they want to type or we can start unmuting folks if you want to um, ask a question directly. I'm just going to keep firing questions until somebody jumps in. Oh, here we go. Um, so Brenda was saying that her current predicament doesn't lead to being around other photographers. How would you suggest connecting with a mentor? Um, right now, there's a lot of different, not just galleries, but 
people that are putting out there where you can actually um, book some time with them. Mm -hmm. um, Santa Fe Portfolio Reviews. Uh, connect with two individuals on Zoom just so we have some dialogue. But honestly, there's um, David Foley was running one-on-one um, -on -one portfolios and then workshops. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's so much out there right now, um, but really trying to find a mentor you can look at some of the different consultants, look at who's giving the different workshops that are out there. Um, your guest, pardon, I cannot think right now, your guest last week was somebody that does consulting. Mm -hmm. Swanee somebody, unfortunately you're gonna pay because um, it's their time and they have all this experience, but even just doing, I hate to say it, a basic someone's Google search for photo mentors, you can find a lot, or photo mentorship, you'll find a lot of people out there. And really another part is within your community. I don't know where you're located, but what type of organizations you have in that community. Six Feet Photo Project is one that's living virtually now. They're mentoring individuals. Meaning people within that community will then branch out. So it's starting that grassroots connections and asking your people if they're from LA, if that's where you're at. Who else you know in LA that I can actually meet with potentially on Zoom because you can't get together. There are health constraints for all of us at this point. Um, I have an, a question. It's Leslie Price. Hi. Hi. So I've been photographing um, telephones similar to what you've been doing. I have images from South Africa and one from Italy. I could send them to you if you're interested. The one from South Africa is fascinating because it's about four or five telephones in a row, you know, and the, each one is busy with people talking. Yeah, online there's actually some other resources that are collecting more and more of them. It's uh, the yes. payphoneproject.com. Payphone. Yes. And then if you search on uh, Instagram too, there's um, all payphone. So there's a lot of other places to share it. Um, right now, typically um, when I get texts from other people and stuff, it's about, um, they're making me aware of other payphones that I should go photograph. Oh, yeah. so at this point, I'm not collecting as much unless they're Rochester, and I typically go out and photograph them. But offline, we can talk about other ways. There are other resources to get those out for you. Well, especially in South Africa, where there's so much poverty, um, pay phones are very needed. They're very needed. Mm -hmm. mm. so, and uh, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but that's one part about Rochester, New York, that a lot of people don't realize. So I understand completely okay. what you mean with that one. Thank, Thank you. you, Leslie. Thank you, Susan. Eric, I'm curious from your experience, you know, this thing that you talked about where you don't want to be a pushy person and yet there's a quality of assertiveness and, and um, confidence even that goes into promoting one's work. Can you say a little more about the culture? You know, like I do fundraising in the in the nonprofit world. So I have a sense of that culture. You don't call first or you email first or you, are, are you starting to get a good feel for the culture and what, how far you can push in? Like what, what feels possible? I really don't push in unless I have um, previous relationship with the people. Um, and that's, that's a character flaw on my part where I'm not a good salesperson of my own work. I can reach out for my students um, to ask for, you know, free portfolio reviews from a bunch of people because of what COVID did to students in the spring. Mm -hmm. But yet I would never reach out to the same people asking for something from my work. So again, it's a character flaw that I know that I have. Um, but part of that also that we can, because of having that social media, a lot of us do it. We see each other getting certain recognition. And it's like, oh, next year I need to remember to apply to that. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that we should be sharing because you're not going to win the same award over and over. And it's also nice to hear a nice little thank you. I see somebody online right now who's a finalist for the AOP award this year, Annette Berg, uh, for her series on cell phone towers. So the idea is we need to be able to share those opportunities, number one, by sharing them with one another. And that's one of the biggest things that I have with people that I surround myself with. We're exchanging connections. And if I get a connection from somebody else that says, oh, you really need to reach out to this person because it's a good fit, or I've even made them aware that you might be reaching out to them, that's where my comfort level lies. And that's, that's just, um, I guess, part of who I am. And I'm fine with that. 
but also allows me to hope that the work speaks for itself in many ways. I love that because I, th I think there's this, this thing that's happened, especially in COVID, where we've separated art and commerce a little bit, you know, like capitalism kind of got put on a little pause. And what we've really noticed during this time is this surge of generosity with people where this idea that they were competing with one another is starting to loosen a little bit and we're seeing more sharing and more cooperation and more generosity. And I just love that that message in terms of carrying it forward that we're not competing with one another. If we place the work central, then I'm going to want your work to be out in the world as much as I'm going to want the next person's work to be out in the world. And I think that's where it's at us just helping each other and supporting each other. It's all reciprocal. And I mean, that's the biggest thing. If I don't do any portraiture. So if I see a call for a certain portrait that I think is going to work with somebody, I mean, that's the whole reciprocal that we need to be doing for one another. Because if we grow as a community, we're going to get that much further. I mean, we're mm -hmm. still fighting with other arts to get photography sometimes recognized, even though we have a lot of opportunities. But how do we push it a little bit further? And yeah. other people that are photographing payphones, they're going to do a different style than I am. We're the penitentiary. So it's, even though then everybody know about artdeadline.com, someone would say, well, wait a minute. Now everybody's going to be applying for the same opportunities. Not every opportunity is meant for myself or anybody on this call. And that's like, that's why you have to do your research because you saw how thick that book is. Yeah. I would need eight assistants to try to apply to all those within three months. So, and that's not going to happen. Anyone else want to jump in? Also, we welcome, um, as part of the community, we welcome folks um, sharing their experiences and sharing their secrets. If you have any you want to share or if you have some thoughts or questions. So I just saw something come through the chat from okay. Brenda about uh, Booksmart Studio yep. um, and Joey L having a, a book printed by us. Yeah. One of the things that we offer is, I try not to get too commercial with this, but is our, what we call our Libro series, which is a portfolio series. And everything's custom made. Um, a few years ago, we made a custom clamshell box for Joey L and portfolios. If those of you that don't know who Joey L is, he's a very influential advertising photographer and now doing a lot of social documentary work, especially during COVID. He's going back to some of his archives. Um, but that's where um, the Booksmart Studio Everything we do at the studio now is, so I go and I review portfolios at SPE, Society for Photographic Education. This year, we were supposed to have, this summer, one student and one faculty member come in for the one month, which would have been June, and just make a limited edition of their books. It would be um, a residency of sorts. But most of the people that are bringing it, it's more of an atelier. Um, Kathleen Tunnel handles on the call, um, Joanne Chouse, you know, inviting some people that I meet at portfolio reviews, come in, use the resources, use the space, um, because I'm lucky to have built what I have right now over the years. And so that's really what Booksmart Studio has turned into more of an atelier, mm -hmm. where if you want to do something, I'd rather have you come in and do it yourself, if you need to just pay for the ink or the paper. But it's about also having that reciprocal relationship on a different level also. Um, so Booksmart Studio, now that I bought the facility that I'm in, once it's paid off, I'll own it. But I don't have the same overhead. Um, I was paying, I, I'll be honest, because I was paying $4,000 a month to rent in the neighborhood of the arts. Mm -hmm. My current mortgage where I'm at now, and I'll own it in another two years, it would only take me five years, is only $900 a month. Mm -hmm. But which has allowed me to focus more on my work and inviting people in. I don't have that same overhead thought. So that's a quick story as to what Booksmart Studio is today. Um, as I said, we have the dark room, we have the non-silver dark room. And the idea with the book arts is bringing people in that I meet. There is no application because I just want to invite people that I believe in their work. Uh, and that's where I go to SPE and even some other people that I've met at portfolio reviews. So. Excellent. Hey, Swanee, I thought I saw your hand go up. Did you want to jump in? Oh. I do. Thanks. I just want to add a couple of things, if I might, to um, all the great conversation that's going on. And, you know, to your point about um, sharing work amongst each other, I have to say there's a number of cities that have organized salon groups. 
And over time, I've seen so many of those people truly grow. I think the first group I knew about was years ago in Boston. Um, Nubar Alexanian had a group of about 10 photographers. I think they maybe stayed together for 10 years. And it was amazing how they grew together. Just incredible. So we see people like Susan Bernstein and um, Jane Fulton Alt now leading uh, critique groups and things. So that's something. I also want to point out that the online portfolio review, which we've all got to really accept is the way it's going to happen. I was a skeptic because I love that experience of being together and the conversation can go right into happy hour downstairs at the hotel. And um, I love meeting the new reviewers I haven't met before. So I did the New England portfolio review recently and it was a typical weekend long thing with dozens of reviewers and dozens and dozens of photographers. And I have to tell you, I'm a, I'm a complete convert now because it was, a, it was a very focused experience like this is here. We, we were all new to it at that point in early August and they did some training sessions for both the reviewers and the photographers together to like learn how to go in and out of the groups. But the bottom line for all of you is there's no hotel, there's no airfare, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, we're not in a freezing hotel ballroom screaming across the table at each other. <laughs> There's no one walking by like trying to get your attention and say hello. It was so focused, you know, to the credit of the organizers, we knew ahead of time who we were going to see, which is one of the things I really appreciate. So I did my homework. The reviewees did their homework. They were ready to share their screens. And I looked at websites and Instagram and all that. And I feel like the 25 minutes was so well used. Hmm. They also gave us on our screen, both sides of us, a five minute warning, a three minute warning, a one minute warning when it started a clock that was counting down. So it was super organized. And then we got our five minute break and we started again with another one. But I left that weekend feeling like these were much more kind of personal and in-depth conversations than we ever had in a crowded room together. So, so look towards those. I'm seeing them sell out so fast. So fast. So fast. So I, I really encourage all of you that can go to one, those of you that can organize one, it's a valuable, valuable experience with the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. online. So I'm a big fan of that. The other thing I want to say about reviews and about competitions, if I may, is that not all of the people that are going to really love your work are on that circuit. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I mean, there may be university muse art museums in uh, large institutions that several of their shows a year, at least I would think, would be in support of the strengths of that university's program, whether it's the environmental studies program or architectural history and urban planning or whatever the case may be. You may have work that's really of interest to a group that are like-minded and they're not on that circuit. So that's when you just have to do your own step out. And Susan, you know this from nonprofit world, you look for who is like-minded because they're gonna stay with you and believe in your project and hopefully support it a long time. So just think outside the box. And I always encourage everybody to look for the portfolio review events that do in fact bring a very different group of people in. Corporate art consultants, people that run exhibitions at airports, um, all different kinds of people are interested in photography today. So um, don't, don't just uh, stay in our own comfortable world and kind of push yourself out. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Swanee. Uh, Swanee, I have a couple of just quick questions on that. In the corporate art world, I think that when, when last time when I did the workshop with you, there was this idea that they are some of the best art buyers at this time, but now COVID and all the shutdown, how is that impacting the corporate, the corporate you know, buying, corporate consult world? I'll share something with you. I think I mentioned to Eric recently. I'm, I'm obsessed with asking everyone that is in the creative communities who are decision makers, buyers, exhibitors, mm -hmm. how they use social media in their research. Because all of our thoughts about social media really mean nothing if we're not using the practices that they're coming to use. And that's exactly. why the photo thing is all about this. So a corporate art consultant I know in Boston before I even had my coat off, we were having dinner together. I said, how are you using Instagram? And she picked up her phone immediately and showed me a new lobby they had done for a client in Pittsburgh that wanted to fill their space with contemporary street pictures of kind of hip and cool downtown Pittsburgh. 
And I said, wait, 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 how'd you find a photographer? And they said, they, she looked at me like I was crazy and said, we hashtag Pittsburgh street photographer. <laughs> and I looked at it at the time and there were only nine photographers that had done that. And some wow. of my favorite street photographers in Pittsburgh weren't even considered for the job because wow. they didn't have that. It was a $20,000 commission. It was an incredibly fair rights package after that. No advertising, they had to come back for it. Minimum $1,500. I mean, it sounded like the old days of licensing. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why I put together that panel for PhotoFest that's happening on mm -hmm. the 19th. We have five people telling us how they use Instagram in their creative research. A senior curator at an, at an encyclopedic institution, a curator at an educational museum, um, a corporate art consultant, Julie Kinselman from Houston, um, a gallery owner, Deborah Klumching, and um, an editorial a picture researcher and picture editor. And then in the second session, which is, it's four hours altogether, not five, but there's a break in the second session. This is what I'm so excited about. Mm -hmm. Elisa Koppelman, who's one of my very favorite photo researchers. I hope some of you have met her at reviews. She's going to do live picture research on using Instagram online wow. that we're going to watch and see how she chooses which hashtags to go to first. So and cool. The mindset is on keyword search for you and your work. So we, we need to know what the people, who we want to meet and, and how they're using it to really make it sing. So that's what that's all about on the 19th. Can you, um, so it's photo fest, F O T O F E S T. Correct. And it's okay. a social media, the link just went up today. It's a social media seminar, social media strategies. I think is that link. That okay. That air. And okay. Um, I'm really excited for us to hear from the other side of the desk as it were about all of our work on social media. I'll share with you, Barbara Tannenbaum is gonna talk about websites primarily because she sees everybody spending all this time on their Instagram when in fact they're not updating and enriching their websites with the kind of information she needs to be able to be your advocate at right. the tutorial meetings. So she's gonna kick everybody's behind. That's <laughs> gonna be fascinating. I hope and is this, is this going to be one of these situations because of Zoom that they're going to be able to have lots more people? Um, it's well, yeah, they're going to. It was designed originally to be a one-day event, uh, the, as all the PhotoFest seminars are during the the meeting place. Right. Um, so when PhotoFest got cut short, our day got cut off. So it was really designed in the beginning to fulfill that obligation for all the people at PhotoFest. Mm -hmm. So they've gotten their invitations ahead of time, and all the reviewers. And then they decided to open it up to the public. They've opened it up. I think there'll be 500 total that can come. And um, I'm all for supporting PhotoFest. They had the wool pulled out from under them at a time when uh, just the, the hotel and airfares alone that they're obligated for, for their international group of reviewers that had to turn around and leave or had already bought tickets. And um, so I, I think it's a good thing and I mm. encourage them to open it to the, to the public. It's valuable information and we need to support all our nonprofits. That's fantastic. Are you up for one more question? Sure. I'll pose it to you and Eric. Um, so, you know, I think back in the day we did a lot more fundraising where we would kick off a project that had, you know, social content, right? We might be studying, um, food insecurity and in, in a neighborhood. And so we would be able to write grants in the ways that, so what does that work support, right? And we would write grants and that thing. And then there was this kind of a stretch in there where, where that intersection between social causes and arts funding kind of got disconnected. And I'm just wondering if I just thought, think that was the best way to um, fund work because it went where it needed to go, right? It went to serve the communities that the work was meant to serve. Are you seeing any reconnection between funders and, and social purpose art in, in communities these days? I am. Eric, are you as I'm well? Seeing, yeah. I mean, especially in Rochester, we're seeing more. Yeah. Excellent. I, I feel like it's still a good plan to find those like-minded people mm -hmm. on that topic, not just the family and friends. Um, it, I see photographers being successful at helping to pre-fund work that they need to invest in to go and make, where they'll get a pick of a portfolio when they get back. 
I see people doing um, library special editions of the portfolio at the end, end of the making of the work that they will pre-sell at mm -hmm. a discounted rate to people. More and more of those kinds of things that place their work in different different kinds of institutions as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we are all pulled in so many. I mean, we all know this. We're getting so many emails a day of, of things that really deserve our time and our money. And it's very hard to to plan our own giving back besides our voice um, at a time when we don't know how long we'll be in a COVID world. Right. And right. so um, I applaud everybody that's able to give back to our own community for the further education of everyone. And I especially applaud people that can help others connect with the ideas to get the work made and seen. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the give back that I really love these days. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, just a few comments in the chat. So Law Hamilton was t um, reminding us to take a look at Kat Karenin's um, Don't Take Pictures. If you haven't checked out first that publication and two, her resource list is fantastic. And just three, she's just such an amazing human being and she's often a, a portfolio reviewer. And um, so definitely check that out. And then there was another mention that um, Atlanta Photography Group has a great workshop to help photographers prepare for portfolio reviews. It's taught by Beth Lilly. Um, and there's some, some there's a, a link there if you haven't scrolled through the chat window. Um, the link has been provided. And let's see. And last year, they actually, Beth Lilly and Judith Fishner went to Photo NOLA with the students. So they traveled with them. So if they got had any questions, they were also there to further even that class wow. out of the classroom. Um, so that's, yeah, with Atlanta Photo Group. Also, shameless plug, next week, there will be a critique with Atlanta Photo Group that I'll be leading. So definitely uh, support <laughs> Atlanta Photo Group. But this is also, we, we uh, made sure to invite Swanee tonight. And now I think you all see why we made sure to invite Swanee tonight. <laughs> You're all gonna get a bill after this, by the way. <laughs> I'm gonna add another comment. I, I hope all of you realize that one of the things that made Eric's presentation to us tonight so dynamic, he documents, documents, documents every step of his work, the making of, the, the producing of, the installation of, I mean, hardly any photographers do that. And Eric does a brilliant job, right? You all know what I'm talking about. You all know how you don't have installation views from half of your shows. So I, I applaud you for that. Eric. You do such a good job of that. It really, really helps. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right, we have Eric here. Let's not, um, we've still got him for eight more minutes. So toss out your questions if you've got, um, I, I have the question nobody's really supposed to ask. Can I just ask the money question? Go ahead. Do you ever, like, this, I'm sorry. I just feel embarrassed to even ask this question, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think there's this question of, like, at what point is there some break even? Like, you've printed, matted, framed, shipped, installed. You know, like, at some point, this kind of labor of love idea, especially for those of us who are also working in the nonprofit sector or have tight budgets, you know, is there some point that you're starting to see a tip where it's paying for itself or, um, I know you're in it for the long haul. So I don't mean to say that that's even the most important okay. thing, but yeah. Um, I'll let you know when I get there in a few <laughs> years, but I'm actually in a, um, a very good place. And with what I do at RIT and NTID, um, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, they, ha they support a lot of what I do for my scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason why I'm able to have so many exhibitions is not just that, but also my wife and I, we sat down when I, I went back to teaching full-time 2012 after we had my son in 2010, because number one, I did want to get back to teaching. But one thing I didn't mention before is the reason why I love teaching is helping people get someplace they want to be. And when I was at Mercer County Community College, I loved that aspect of it because the kids all worked hard. Mm -hmm. um, I did not apply for a full-time job with the photo school for many, many years. I'm not putting it down, but I just had a problem with the apathy of the students. So when this job with NTID came up, I took that job because many of those students 
um, aren't always given the opportunity that they need. And so when I did decide to take that job, uh, we sat down and my RIT salary goes to the family. I'm not allowed to touch that. So I have a separation of state because whatever I make at the studio, that goes towards paying for my exhibitions. Um, to put it um, bluntly, since COVID hit in July, I have not applied for many exhibitions at all. Very, very little. I think maybe three or four because funds have dried up. But I'm not allowed to take from the purse that's for the family. And that's how my wife and I, we separated it. And that's just part of what's going on with COVID. I'm not the only one, obviously. Uh, my wife's position was eliminated with the city school district. So we just had to make sure of certain things. Um, and really, honestly, yes, everything does go back into it. But learning about even booking, seeing Susan K. Grant again, the fact of don't overlap the, show, overlap the shows because then you have to pay for double framing, which it helps to hear somebody else say that. And it's kind of like, duh. She goes, if the galleries really want you, they'll work around that. Maybe we'll find a different time. And when I negotiated, it really helped because now I don't have the exhibition framed two, three times. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what I do with this exhibition is I also ship it unframed using earth magnets because it works that way. I have it both ways depending on what the gallery's budget is because if they don't have any shipping, I need to be smart about, I can't afford to pay $1,000 to ship 45 pieces all the way to Point Reyes Station. So we ship the prints with just the gallery magnets. So it's looking at the cost benefit at times and sometimes you have to say no. Mm -hmm. There were two solo show opportunities I had in 2020 that I had to say no because there's no funding and they said it had to be framed. It was not gonna work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of looking at that too. It doesn't mean um, it hurts to say no, but at what point does it just, it's no longer cost effective. So, and honestly for making money, um, everything I do goes back into my practice. So I'm not really looking at that in that way, but even to buy my film, whenever I get awards or whatnot, it typically goes to film or chemistry. So I'm just reinvesting all the time. Mm -hmm. so. Can I add something to that, Eric? Yep. The, uh, and you're absolutely right. So many of the juried shows now, if you read the fine print, you'll see that they do expect you to send them frames. So discussing with them about an alternative is great. But I just wanted to share with all of you, I had an interesting discussion with Bill Hunt today, and we were talking about the challenges with all the European shows, wanting you to, to send your files and have them print your files. And I'm hearing this from so many people going, what do I do? And do they really, you know, they really send you a movie that they're gonna tear it up at the end? And what Bill did for a show, he was asked to put together a show um, for, I think it, it, one of the, festivals in Poland. And what he sent them for the files was the picture of the work in the frame. <laughs> so when they printed it out and installed it in the exhibition, they were framed prints. It looked the way the artist really wanted because you never really know if that's going to be done elsewhere. Obviously, you know, for so many of you, all of you, it's about the print quality. But if you do get those opportunities abroad, and we've all been very hesitant about that. I thought that was a really good solution in being able to be kind of as best represented as you could be in a European situation. There's far more festivals in Europe than there are in America. Some fantastic festivals with lots of portfolio reviews that are going online now too. But just a thought about sending files. And same thing, you can negotiate with them. The Malamigi lab that I was given the award where they're trying to sell work for me now um, part of it was they were supposed to print it. I said, I'm sorry, if you want this to go forward, I need to print. You're not going to have that cost, but will you pay for this shipping? Mm -hmm. And they agreed to it, so we moved forward. And it was that negotiation. I said, look, I'm not going to charge you for the print, but that way I know the control, the addition. I don't have to worry about And that's part of me being a print control freak. That's what I teach. Um, so there are room. there is always room for negotiation depending on who you're working with. Even the piece for the exhibition, I shipped the print, they framed it there, I paid to have it framed because it was gonna be ridiculous to ship a framed piece to uh, Italy. Mm -hmm. So, but I, again, it's me being a print control freak and I know that's what I am. Um, those of you that know me personally, you know I am. Um, but that's why I just couldn't let that go, personally. 
Thank you so much. We've just got a few more minutes. Um, I, th this was to Diana Green's question a minute ago when you had talked about having raw images and swapping them with a friend. Um, what did you learn? Being that you are a print control freak, as you say, how was that for you to see someone else interpret your images um, with as particular as you are about that? Um, to be honest, I'll go back to an image that many of you might know. I'll share it in a second. If I can find my work now. All right. So let's start on the slide. So this particular piece. Oh, great. Hold on. Not even gonna worry about how it looks. Some of you might know this piece of mine, which is called the drapery. Mm -hmm. Um, this is one that I swapped with the Ricardo Barros. Ricardo is the one who helped me to see the final vision of this piece. And that's being 100% complete honest. I didn't see it as dark around the edges. We saw too much of the wall. But when he saw it, so I've learned work about my work sometimes that made it that much better. Mm -hmm. And this is that one of those pieces. The students, right now, my grad students tomorrow will be showing each other what they did with each other's files. And sometimes, and it, they give each other the files. I tell them if they do a really good job, they could buy, you know, a six pack or something for each other, whatever they drink, <laughs> even if it's Dr. Pepper like me. But the idea is you learn that much more by that because we are sometimes too attached to when we push the button and we aren't always bringing that forward. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you look at and say, that's not what I intended at all. It's mm -hmm. typically a 50, 50 mix within the classroom. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Anyone else have a question? Want to be the last question of the night, anybody? Or if you're an exhibiting artist that's on this call and you want to share some of your thoughts or tips, um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, we'd love to hear from you. People feeling shy tonight. <laughs> Let's see. We will get a lot of warm and, and encouraging comments, Eric, that I will um, copy the text files and send those to you so that you get to see them. And um, I just wanna remind folks that we are here every Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, we have got an incredible lineup. We're starting to, you know, Six Feet was never imagined as a project that was gonna have a long history. So one of the things we're gonna be doing over the next six to eight weeks is partnering with other photo communities around the country to help you get connected to um, communities that are going to continue to support you past COVID. Um, we're keeping our fingers crossed that this won't last forever, <laughs> and, which means the Six Feet Project won't last forever. We have a couple of exhibitions coming up. So I wanna encourage you again to go to the website, use the submission form there. We have about six new curators that are gonna be coming on over the next eight weeks to do guest curated galleries. And um, we love to see your images come in. And of course, the purpose of this project was to encourage photographers to share their lived experiences of the pandemic. So that doesn't mean your, your images need to be focused on the pandemic, but just taken from inside of this time to share your lived experiences with us. And um, we're always so grateful. People's lives are busy and we're just grateful that you continue to share your time with us. And um, we appreciate you very much. Thank you, Eric. Oh my gosh. And Swanee, thank you. This was incredible and so generous of you. And if one thing I'll ask, if anybody has any questions, I'll put it up on the screen quick. My okay. e here's my email. If you have any questions after the fact, I have one rule. If I don't respond within 48 hours, it means it's been buried. Do not worry about emailing again. Um, so that you can see at the bottom, it's just simply Eric at ericunsman.com. And there's my hashtag. Or social media as well. Perfect. Um, but just wanted to share that for that reason. Uh, thank you. And we just had a quick question come in about submitting images. Yes, if you've submitted images in the past, we are assuming that you this is unfolding for you over time. 
And when they drop into our big submission folder, the reason we asked you to put your first name and last name right at the beginning of your file is because they drop right into your folder. That is how we do our featured galleries. We have um, an editorial team that goes into there. And if we start to see a nice little pile of your images that are starting to make cohesive sense, we actually go through there and that's how we build the features on the website. Um, and again, we have people curating from the Instagram hashtag as well as from the photos that you submit. And um, if you haven't had a chance when um, Judith did the call, the make me feel call, Judith Puckett, she did ask people to do five print mini portfolios and everyone that submitted for that call agreed to let us share them. So if you haven't had a chance, it's every single photographer that submitted to that call and their five print portfolio. And they're just, it's just touching and beautiful work. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's up on the content section of the Six Feet website. If you're not on our mailing list, um, be sure to sign up. This week at Six Feet goes out every Monday and it will give you um, all the upcoming exhibitions and calls for entry and all that good stuff. So thank you all again for being here and we'll see you next week. Bye.